Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cultivating a Data Fluent Culture Track. My name is Paola Johnson. I'm ThoughtSpot's head of community, and I am so excited to be your host here at Beyond. One of my favorite things about Beyond is, is connecting with everyone and just feeling that buzz and energy from you all. So please don't be shy and engage in the chat. I'll be there shortly. We all know that when it comes to being fluent in a language, it's all about how do you take data in a sense and turn it into action. We've seen that in the hands of employees, once they have access to this information, they are more engaged in their role, they're more productive, and most importantly, they're making better decisions. I think all of us want a little bit more of that, don't we? In today's track, you'll hear from expert partners and our customers and best practices that you could start applying to build that data fluent culture in your organization that we're seeing is powering the data, digital transformation across all industries. We'll also discuss the role that the analyst of the future plays when it comes to this cultural shift and how important it is for diversity in data that helps us prevent bias at scale. To start us off, uh, our first session of the day is cultivating a data fluent culture, the essence and essentials. Our first speaker is CEO and founder of the Data Lodge, Valerie Logan. Valerie, thank you for joining us today. I'll pass things over to you now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paula. It's so great to be here with the ThoughtSpot family. And there is nothing I would love to talk more about than data literacy and data fluency. And I just want to take a second and acknowledge, I love how ThoughtSpot refers to this as data fluency. And um, because I really see data literacy and fluency at, you know, on either end of the same spectrum. And to mark that, to commemorate that, I have decorated the Scrabble board for today's occasion with fluency and literacy uh, intersecting right at the center of the board. So with that, let's go ahead and get started in talking about how do you cultivate a data fluent culture. So in today's session, I am thrilled to be able to talk through a few dynamics around what's going on in the market around this area, um, who are the pioneers and what are they doing to drive a data fluent culture, and what can you do about it? What are the best practices that you can apply um, to start this, this momentum? And it's really a movement. So how do you want to be, play a part in this movement? So the market in the myths, um, you know, it's 2020. Um, we have had what I would call an unexpected awakening for the topic of data literacy and fluency. So let's just take a little uh, trip down memory lane. So the last few years, um, data literacy and data fluency have been emerging as part of the chief data officer agenda. Analytics leaders have been looking at data culture um, and the upskilling of the workforce as a key cornerstone to how do you create a modern data and analytics strategy. But often this has been viewed as kind of just training or visualization or um, a lot of focus on the upskilling side of, of data literacy. So there's been some great developments over the past few years with, um, I was leading research at Gartner on this topic. Um, there's other work around um, assessments and training resources. But if I'm, if I'm really honest today, um, a lot of this has been somewhat viewed as academic and maybe a bit abstract. Enter the year 2020, where um, data literacy just got real and it really can no longer be ignored. And the, the COVID pandemic has um, made this personal for all of us, uh, not only in our work roles, but in our uh, personal lives with our friends and families trying to make critical life decisions. So what I'd ask you to do is just to appreciate that this topic is no longer just a work thing. It is personal. And I think that's one of the ways you start to really crack the culture code is how do you make this relevant to everyone in their personal lives? And um, unfortunately, COVID did that and it has brought it to the forefront. But the challenge is how do you balance? How do 
analytics leaders balance the need to upskill the workforce and the culture with all of these competing needs around modernizing the platform and um, uh, driving trusted data and data governance. So that's what we'll be exploring is how to do this in parallel. So the very first thing that we need to do is start with a, with a definition. And I'd like to share with you how I frame data literacy um, for any industry across the globe, which is, first of all, um, to appreciate that data literacy as a foundation capability has really been elevated now as an equivalent to people, process, and technology. And you know, if you've been around a while, you know that classic trinity of people, process, and technology. It's the way that we have thought about how do you change an organization. But with the digitization of our work, our lives, um, our society, you know, anything from um, how do we consume information, um, how do we serve customers, um, you know, we're, we're walking sensors with our uh, smartphones. Our worlds are digital now. And so data has been elevated as an equivalent vector to people, process, and technology. And this is really why the role of the chief data officer and the analytics leader has been elevated to a C-suite role. And it's also why data literacy and fluency is a workforce competency not just for the specialist. Um, so, you know, I'm an old math major quant, so I've always kind of appreciated the role of data, but now it's prevalent to all, right, in work and life. So this is a mindset shift. And in addition to the mindset shift, um, let's look at what really makes up the elements of what does it mean to be data literate? So I like to call it the ability to read, write, and communicate with data in context, in both work and life, and that it has two pieces. It has a vocabulary. So the vocabulary includes three basic sets of terms. So it includes data terms, obviously. So data sources, data attributes, data quality. There are analysis methods and concepts and terms. You know, it could be anything from a bar chart to uh, an advanced machine learning algorithm to the value drivers. Right, the business acumen, what problems are we solving? So if you really break it down, it's those three sets of terms that make up the vocabulary. But it's not just the terms, it's also what we do with those terms and the skills. And the skills, I like to refer to those as um, the acronym T, T-E-A. How do you think? How do you engage with others? And how do you act or apply with data constructively? So hopefully that gives you a good basis for how we think about data literacy. And of course, the, the stronger you get in data literacy drives you towards higher degrees of data fluency. So I like to say we need to make this personal. And when we think about the different roles that we have in life and the different backgrounds that we bring, we think about the diversity and the inclusion of all people and all backgrounds. Um, diversity to me is in addition to diversity of um, our gender identification, diversity of our racial backgrounds and, and histories. Diversity is also what is, what is our work experience and our life experience. So one of the things I really like to do is to use this quote when talking about data literacy, which is we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. So what we do is we create permission to say, you know what, it's okay that maybe you have some fear about this topic, or you may have some um, vulnerability around using, um, you know, interactive dashboards. Um, you know, it's all about how we each come to this topic and how we support each other. So what I'd like to do is just describe um, how we do that. And the way that I like to teach that is this idea that we, we foster data literacy by acknowledging that really you learn this language, you, you learn this through embracing it like learning a second language. So just take a second and think about, you know, what languages you speak, right? And maybe, maybe it's one, maybe it's two, often there's, you know, multiple, but you can embrace data literacy and fluency like it's a language. And somehow that creates permission for people to just say, you know what, it's okay that I don't necessarily speak this language, um, but, but I can try. 
So the way that we like to break this down, and I call this ISL, information as a second language, built off of the ESL construct of English as a second language. And it starts with that basic vocabulary, right? Every language has a vocabulary. And what I mentioned earlier in the definition is this idea that there are three basic sets of terms, value, information, and analysis. And everybody, when they're learning things, likes to have like a, a little mnemonic, right? So this is called the VIA model. And you can take this and you can apply it to any use case and you can welcome others into the conversation and say, you know, I really understand the V and the I, but I'm not a quant. I don't understand the A. So even just having this basic little triangle called the VIA model starts to create a frame for a shared conversation. But it's not just the vocabulary. It's also about the dialects. So if you are in a hospital, you talk about patient outcomes. If you are in insurance, you talk about um, underwriting and claims related outcomes. So the beauty of this language is there is a core construct for a vocabulary, but then it gets contextualized. And the beauty of that is even if you're a classic business person that don't, you don't think you're a data or an analytics person, you bring something to the party. You bring something to this language, which is you understand the value drivers. So hopefully that's a good basis for you. But it's not just the language, it's also the constructs. How do you think, how do you interact, and how do you add value? So here's a little double click of the TEA um, acronym to show you it's, are you aware of context? So when you're watching the news, which can be interesting these days, are you actually stepping back and taking pause and saying, hmm, I wonder what the source of that is. I wonder what the assumptions are. Or when you're in interacting with others, what is your degree of the ability to tell a data story, right? Do you have comfort and confidence interacting with others? And then on the applying, this is at the end of the day, this is all about helping people make decisions. So when you're making a decision, are you being conscientious of the ethics, right? The ethics or the potential bias in what you're looking at and what you're potentially doing. So I hope this provides you a nice frame. Just if you take nothing else away, take away the VIA model as a way to think about a use case and, and application of data, that there's different dialects. So when you're interacting with somebody, think of, oh, what dialect are they speaking? And then these three basic skill sets that we're helping the workforce to uh, upscale on. But the last thing is, um, you know, there's, there's different levels of proficiency. And this is the point of literacy versus fluency. Depending on your role, not everyone needs to speak um, data at the same level. So what we're trying to do is get everyone at least to a shared level of conversational data, right? A, a basic level of foundation literacy. But based on your role, you will develop different degrees of fluency. The last point of treating this as a language is the idea that we don't just learn language through training. We learn language through interaction and experience. So I would encourage you to just think about all, what are all the different ways you can learn language and apply those to your relationship with data. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, there, there's a few myths out there around this topic of data literacy, and I just want to do a little myth busting real quickly, um, just so you can be on, the, be on the lookout for these. So first of all, data literacy is not about just about training. Training and assessments are certainly a cornerstone. However, when you think about developing a language, yeah, you can use a, a Rosetta Stone or one of those techniques, but that only gets you so far. It's conversations you have, it's immersion. Um, so keep in mind, it's not just about training. There are many ways to develop language. Secondly, data literacy is not just about internal structured data and statistics. There are so many different types of data sets, audio, video, text, um, and so many different methods for synthesizing that content. So keep in mind, this isn't just about kind of classic data and methods. The third is visualization and storytelling are such a beautiful way to bring data literacy to life, but it's not only about visualization and storytelling. Right? So there are different techniques, there are different methods, um, and we'll talk in a minute about how ThoughtSpot is embedding a lot of the data literacy capabilities into the environment. So it's not just about visualization and storytelling. 
And it's certainly not about making everybody a junior data scientist. The key is to identify, you know, if you're a um, call center representative, if you are um, an operations manager, if you are the CEO, what is the appropriate profile of literacy and fluency for you? The last point, and hopefully you get this by now, is this is not just a work skill. And I think this is one of the best um, services that we can provide to our employees is when you train an employee and help them upskill their data fluency, you're actually upskilling the household and their friends and their family because you're teaching them and then they can continue to teach. So at the end of the day, when we talk about what are the needs and drivers? Like where's the return and, and what are the, the main objectives of, of you know, to having a C-suite embrace data literacy as a program? There are primarily four key themes that come up that I hear all the time that I work with clients on. Number one is, this is how you help accelerate the shift to a data-informed and insight-driven culture. Or I actually like how ThoughtSpot refers to signals Right? So it's not even just insights, it's how do you distill all this noise right? and, and respond to the signals, but to do that collectively and culturally. Secondly, this is about unlocking what I call radical collaboration. So while, while these terms often sometimes are viewed as, oh, we need to upskill the, the, the full population, this is as much about unlocking how data scientists, data engineers, and business analysts collaborate. Right, There's a, there is work to be done there, an opportunity there. The third is, yes, we need to do this in the context of upskilling for digital um, dexterity. So what I mean by that is data literacy and fluency is in the context of a whole series of other upskilling objectives. So becoming more agile, um, understanding um, process automation, um, understanding um, the, the broader um, ability, you know, AI and infer, uh, Internet of Things, sensors, right? So this is part of a portfolio of upskilling. But at the end of the day, it comes down to comfort and confidence. If people are not comfortable with decision making in their role, at their level, in their, those moments that matter, you won't get the kind of engagement. So this is also about fostering comfort and confidence. The last thing is, you know, you have so much data and analytics talent in your organization. And what we want to do is we want to maximize that talent. We really want to reduce dependency on uh, reports and, hey, can you, can you put that together for me and really enable not just self-service, but democratizing that access and creating that freedom of access, but also freeing up capacity. So if you're looking to build the case for a program, these are the primary four drivers um, that you can uh, identify clear ROI. And, and I call ROI, I, I refer to ROI two ways, um, return on investment and also risk of ignoring. Um, so you gotta be careful, you ignore these, uh, they're gonna come back uh, to haunt you later. Um, so ho hopefully this helps you build the case. So let's take a look at um, what is a data literacy program? So it's one thing to say, yeah, that sounds good, but how do you collectively and systemically start to enable this culture change? So in pioneering data literacy programs, I like to call a data literacy program a commitment. Right? This is an intentional commitment to upskill the workforce and the culture. And there's really three pieces to that. The first is it has to be scoped to say, we are about enabling the full potential of all associates. And sometimes some of my clients are extending that beyond the, the virtual walls of their organization to say, um, so I'm working with a, a US federal agency, they're talking about data literacy for citizens, right? Extending it outside the wall. So it's really about all your constituents um, and, and associates. Secondly, it is about fostering shared language and the modern data literacy abilities. The third is putting a real focus on what are the moments that matter. So with any kind of heavy change program, there's always a risk that it can, um, it, it can get very vague. So here's some examples of the moments that you're really trying to identify and the moments that matter. We do that through three things. Um, I'll just paint those real quick. One is 
engagement. How do you engage with the leaders? How do you develop community? And how do you drive communications? Secondly, we do that through development. We do that through language development explicitly, self-paced learning, and then of course, broader professional development and training. The third area, enablement. This one is often overlooked in any kind of data literacy program. And this is where ThoughtSpot is driving innovation left and right. This is about augmentation of the experience. So if we expect data literacy and, and data fluency to be developed only through training and not augmenting the experience in the environment, we will miss a huge opportunity. So ThoughtSpot won the announcement yesterday with Search Assist. This is a beautiful example of how we are augmenting guided data literacy, right? To support um, an end user in asking data rich questions and to not expect them to have to know all the forms and features is no different than how a GPS does not tell you uh, latitude and longitude, a GPS tells you turn left, turn right. So the ability to augment that the way that ThoughtSpot does is so powerful. And one of my clients calls it data literacy by design. So how are we in designing that into the environment? And at the end of the day, the last and fourth lever of how you drive a program is you've got to have someone um, orchestrating this change. So there is, a, is an art and a science to data literacy program development. So a couple uh, examples of pioneers. So one pioneer, uh, Nationwide Building Society, um, incredible work on um, how they are leveraging um, ThoughtSpot in particular to um, have conversations with data. They are creating frictionless voyages uh, with data and they're using the Spot IQ tool to recommend personalized insight. Right? This is an example of that enablement that I was just um, explaining. Second example, Red Hat. Red Hat, um, they like to describe this as going farther, faster than with a small group of experts. They also refer to it as supporting data conversations, again, with that idea of language. So what's the difference between pioneers and procrastinators? Because what I'm seeing in the market right now is we've got these frontline pioneers who are driving these programs, but then there's um, kind of a DIY do-it-yourself mentality going on. So I just wanted to share what I'm observing as this contrast. So procrastinators are kind of thinking, I have no idea to where to even start with this. Whereas pioneers are saying, you know what, this is absolutely central. Let's figure it out. Procrastinators are saying, you know what, um, this probably isn't the right time for this program. Uh, other things are more important. And pioneers are like, you know what, we don't have an option. Fast forward a year from now, do we really think this is going to organically change? This is pervasive to everything we do. Procrastinators are saying, I don't even know who to put in charge for this. And pioneers are saying, this needs a lead, this needs someone focusing on it, and a network of influencers. And then finally, procrastinators are generally going, you know, we're just going to wing this, and uh, we'll just, we'll stand up an academy. We'll put some courses together. And pioneers are saying, you know what, we need to work smart, we need to launch, we need to leverage, and we need to scale. So I hope that this has inspired you that, you know, there really are many ways to go forward, as FDR said and only one way of standing still. So uh, not taking an action is a choice and uh, there were, you know, it does have impact. So a couple of just quick things to wrap up. Uh, one is how do you get started with a data literacy program? So I recommend seven steps. Who's your sponsor and who's the lead? Craft your case for change, make it explicit, develop that narrative. Craft a blueprint that's scalable, but that has an initial plan where data literacy is part of, not separate. Run some pilot workshops. These can be so fun and you can tackle the fear and vulnerability concern with really going after like, how, uh, how do we speak data across different diverse parts of the team? These are so fun. And um, what I find is when I teach people how to run a workshop like this, they absolutely want to repeat it and they get demand for more and more workshops. Launch pragmatically, right? We don't have any time or energy for uh, big, expansive programs. Identify some quick wins, um, ignite the grassroots movement, low cost. Um, there are many ways to do that. Engage the influencers, 
right? Ignite this bottom up movement and find ways to welcome um, all to the party. And then finally, um, you got to think about scale, right? Over time, this is a partnership with learning and development, a partnership with HR. This becomes the fabric of how do you onboard people? How do you sustain people? How do you develop? So the last um, thing I want to just caution you on is there's a few kind of big mistakes in this area. One is you have to be clear on what you're solving for, right? What does this really mean? What does it look like? What are the needs and drivers? Where is this being done well today? So be very clear on what you're solving for. Secondly, uh, language matters, right? If, uh, if that has not been clear, uh, language um, is the common thread and it is the basis for literacy and fluency. Third, going it alone. If you try to tackle this and try to wing it, um, Google searching uh, data literacy, you will spend your time and energy, which is as precious of a currency as your money, um, on uh, efforts that um, take more time. And there is a lot to be leveraged through, through various partnerships and leverage of your uh, vendor providers like ThoughtSpot. Last thing, a quick story. Um, over 100 years ago, Ford Motor Company, uh, think, about, think about who the worker population was in the plants. They were immigrants coming from all different countries having different native languages. What was happening in the environment, in the plants, is they were experiencing significant safety issues and efficiency issues. The root issue was lack of a shared language. I truly believe that we are at the same moment um, where we are lacking a shared language around data. So what Ford did was they created the Ford English School and they started to nurture that shared language. And I believe that that's exactly what we're doing now, right? So um, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave this picture though and not acknowledge um, not a lot of diversity in that room. So uh, I know we would have more diversity now uh, if we brought everyone together. But um, I just hope that this story resonates with you as the power of language as a foundation for growing literacy and fluency. Thank you for joining us. We're actually gonna be jumping into the next session. So grab a quick water break, but don't wander too far. Uh, you definitely do not wanna miss the second session of today. We're going to be exploring how to scale the impact and how to become a change agent in your organization and become that analyst of the future. So see you soon.